Hello, and welcome to a lecture on power amplifier classes. Here's an overview of this lecture. First, a quick review of what we talked about in a previous lecture, that is the generic power amplifier model, the simple schematic that we're using to analyze and describe power amplifiers, and uh, class A operation. Then we'll move on to class B, and we'll say a little bit more about this thing called the harmonic filter, which appeared in the generic power amplifier model. I'll talk about class AB. We'll talk about the concept of conduction angle, which turns out to be another way to characterize differences between power amplifiers. Then we'll talk about nonlinear high efficiency power amplifiers. And those will include class C, and C might as well mean common here because Class C is extremely common in power amplifier implementation. And then classes D, E, and F, which are also nonlinear and increasingly common in modern communication systems. Considerations in power amplifier design. And finally, the idea of repurposing nonlinear power amplifiers for linear applications. So here, just to remind you, is our generic power amplifier model. In this case, shown as a bipolar transistor, but again, it could just as easily be a FET transistor and would change hardly anything about this design or the analysis we're going to do here. An RF choke, which connects the collector directly to the supply. A blocking capacitor, which again isolates the DC from the output. And you could think of this as a bias T, of course. The harmonic filter, which we talked about very briefly in the last lecture, but we'll have more to say about this time. And then, of course, the load hanging out over here. Now class A linear operation, which we explained in the previous lecture, is the one that you're used to, and it's the one that we assumed in small signal RF design, which is we select some bias point here where the input output characteristic is approximately linear. A small magnitude here translates to the same waveform with a larger magnitude over here. But then we also talked about quasi-linear operation. The idea there is to improve the efficiency because see in either case we're pulling a DC current which is right about here and that DC current is about the same but in the quasi-linear approach we're getting a much bigger output so the overall efficiency that is the magnitude of this output relative to the power associated with a steady current draw is getting bigger it's becoming more efficient. In class B we continue that idea. In fact, we continue it to what might initially seem to be an absurd extent. Here, what we're going to do is we're going to center the input waveform at zero and allow the positive peak to extend over the full range of the transfer characteristic. So here's that peak. And for the downstrokes here and here, we get nothing because the transistor can't uh, conduct current uh, when the input is at that level. So the first thing you'll note here is that we're missing half the waveform. Now we're going to deal with that problem in just a moment, but first let me show you why this is desirable. The useful feature of this is that unlike in class A operation where there is a steady DC current always being pulled through the collector, here there are fractions of time at least half the time, where we're pulling no current at all, and yet we're getting this enormous waveform. So if we can tolerate this kind of weird distortion, then it's clear that this is going to give us a big efficiency boost, because we're getting comparably sized output for a DC current, which is going to be much less, because half the time we're not pulling any current at all. So let's work out what the efficiency actually is. It's quite straightforward. The power dissipated by the load resistor, R sub L, is 1 half I L squared R L, using the same variables that we used in the previous lecture. But we're only pulling half the power because we only have half the waveform. So the power dissipated in the load resistor in class B is half what we would have pulled if we were in class A operation. Now the power consumed from the power supply is a little bit more difficult to calculate because that DC current level, the time average DC current level is not immediately obvious, but it's not hard to calculate either. 
it's a simple integral. The integral is just averaging, right? So here is the waveform. We're going to integrate that over the uh, appropriate interval, divide by that interval, and uh, which is one period of the carrier. So it's a very simple integral to do. What we find is that the DC current, the time average current that is, is I sub L divided by pi. So very simple result. And then remember efficiency, in this case collector efficiency, is P sub L, which we obtained up here, divided by PDC. So this is the efficiency. We can evaluate that a little bit further uh, by evaluating the uh, expression for the largest possible voltage swing that can be accommodated without clipping. And if we assume that VCC is large relative to 0 0.7 volts, then that means that I sub L, R sub L should be less than V sub CC to achieve this condition. And then we can evaluate this expression. We obtain 78%. That's the approximate maximum efficiency for class B. And that compares to 50% for class A when we're quasi-linear. So we see the efficiency of class B is significantly improved over class A. And the price we paid is to mangle that waveform, is to lose half the waveform. So how is it that we can tolerate this? To explain that, here is this uh, schematic. And here are the input and output waveforms, which again clearly demonstrate that class B is mangling the waveform. Well, the one way to think about this is that this is going to create very large harmonics. So whereas the input waveform has a spectrum, which just consists of a sinusoid, the output spectrum is going to have that sinusoidal component, and then a Fourier series component for harmonics. And that next harmonic is going to be gigantic. So one way to think about how to deal with this is to filter the output in such a way that we can exclude the harmonic, at least the, the next one, and maybe even higher order harmonics. So one way to interpret the harmonic filter is not just as a way to deal with the distortion due to the quasi-linear operation that we're implementing here, but also as restoration of the missing part of the waveform. Because if we take these higher order harmonics and remove them, we're back to this. So in other words, the harmonic filter is restoring the missing part of the waveform. So what we'll have in the output is once again a full sinusoid. By the way, yet another way of thinking about this is that the harmonic filter is storing energy here and releasing it when there is no current conducting through the transistor. And I should note here that this will be the case with all subsequent classes that we investigate, certainly class AB, but class C Class D, we will also implement this scheme where we allow ourselves to mangle the waveform by preventing the transistor from conducting some fraction of the time, thereby improving the efficiency, and then we'll restore the waveform to some extent doing this kind of processing, harmonic filtering. There are other ways to go with this, but this is, this is really the central idea. So that brings us to the topic of Class AB and conduction angle. Class AB is when the transistor conducts more than 50% of the time, which is what we have in class B, but less than 100% of the time, which is what we have in class A. So the intermediate case is the input waveform being arranged such that we don't necessarily go all the way to class B, but we're certainly not in class A operation either. It's a compromise. And that brings us to the idea of conduction angle. So conduction angle simply refers to the fraction of time expressed as a number of degrees between 0 and 360 that the transistor is conducting. So for class A, we say the conduction angle is 360 degrees because there is no time when it's not conducting. For class B, we're conducting half the time over one half period of a sinusoid, so we say it's 180 degrees. And then, of course, class AB is somewhere between 180 and 360 degrees, and really any value in that range is considered class AB. And all the other classes of power amplifiers can also be assigned a conduction angle based on this idea, how much, what fraction of time is that transistor conducting. So now we're ready to behold the full menagerie of power amplifier classes of operation. And here I've identified the class, uh, whether we consider it to be linear or not linear, and which way it's not linear, 
conduction angle, the efficiency, which is collector efficiency for a bipolar transistor and drain efficiency for a FET, what we get in practice for efficiency, which is, of course is always less for various reasons, and then the typical uses. So for example, class A linear operation, well, normally we don't use that for power amplifier design. It has horrible efficiency, and uh, that's usually enough to preclude its use. It is, however, exactly what we're using for RF small signal amplification. So until we start talking about power amplifiers, pretty much every amplifier we talked about was assumed to be class A linear. Class A quasi-linear, also 360 degrees conduction angle, ideal efficiency of 50% if we're quasi-linear. If we run the waveform all the way to the rails, it's 50%. In practice, we can get about 35%. That's, that's a pretty common class A quasi-linear efficiency. And this shows up in single sideband modulations and for high order quadrature amplitude modulation. Uh, this particular modulation requires very high linearity, so you really don't have much choice but to use Class A. Class AB is kind of like Class A, except with a reduced conduction angle, which means you get an efficiency somewhere between that of Class A and Class B, so somewhere between 50 and 78 percent. In practice, somewhere between 35 and 60 percent, and that's commonly used for AM modulation and for low-order digital modulations like uh, BPSK. Class B, again, quasi-linear operation. We run that waveform uh, to the rails. 180-degree conduction angle, 78% efficiency as we just derived, typically about 60%. That's commonly used for SSB, although it has some other applications. Now, the rest of these are what we're about to talk about. Class C, D, E, and F. These are just different ways to mangle the waveform uh, to increase efficiency, but with different trade-offs. So all of these are distinctly nonlinear. In fact, what we're doing in these three classes is we'll just simply use the transistor as a switch. We won't even try to get the waveform that we apply. But here are the applications for these in case you're interested, and they do have applications. But let's now talk a little bit about these. So class C, probably the most commonly implemented power amplifier class in history. Class C, the conduction angle is typically reduced below 180, again with this idea of improving efficiency. Also, it's common to drive the transistor into clipping. So not only do we only get the upticks in the sinusoid, but we don't even try to create a sinusoid at the output. What we do instead is we try to drive it into saturation to some extent. I mean, there's different ways to implement Class C with slightly different outcomes. But this is a fairly common uh, output waveform to see at the transistor collector or drain. So this is okay for constant modulus modulations, the classic example of this being FM. In FM, there's no information in the magnitude, so you don't really care what the waveform looks like. All the information is in phase. So as long as the phase and frequency relationship is okay here, this is really fine. And keep in mind, we also have the harmonic filter. And the harmonic filter does a pretty good job of cleaning this up. Classes D, E, and F. These are all schemes which are focused on minimizing the power dissipated in the transistor. So like Class C, they're utterly nonlinear. We're not really going to say any more about them, although you can read a few more details in the textbook. But these are the key ideas. These types of power amplifiers are of great interest because by improving efficiency, we're improving things like battery life in a mobile phone. So even though they're decidedly nonlinear, they're of great interest, and there's a lot of interest in trying to find ways to make them behave more like linear amplifiers. That's a topic I'll touch on in just a moment. So some considerations that apply to all power amplifiers. First, supply voltage, how to keep it low. I showed you in a previous lecture that a Class A amplifier easily can have a supply voltage that's required to be in the tens of volts. I think in the example it was 24 volts is what we settled on. And that's pretty high, especially for a mobile device. So a difficult problem in power amplifier design is how to keep the supply voltage low. And a common answer is to use a low output impedance, which then introduces a whole set of problems with output matching. So that's one issue with power amplifier design. Load impedance matching, in particular this issue known as load pulling. And the problem is that because the amplifier is nonlinear, 
There's no one right set of bias conditions or output impedances that work. So there's a range of impedances that all apply at different moments or different parts of the waveform. So this is known as load pulling and trying to find an optimum impedance match that's kind of a compromise over all the impedance matches that are in effect over the span of a waveform is a, a relatively difficult problem. The idea of source impedance matching buffers and drivers. Key point here is that power amplifiers deliver power and they're not really gain devices. So people rarely talk about the gain of a power amplifier. The whole idea is figuring out how to get something to control the transistor and then letting that transistor deliver the power to the load. So this creates a whole new set of problems with input impedance matching and involves auxiliary devices at the input known as buffers and drivers, which are intended to condition the input in a way that optimizes that control of the transistor. Peak to average power ratio. That's what PAPR stands for, peak to average power ratio, also known as crest factor. See, what happens is that uh, simple waveforms like FM and AM have peak to average ratio of 1. In other words, the peak power is equal to the average power. But other kinds of waveforms tend to have a different peak level than they do an average level. And a common example is OFDM. OFDM modulations are notorious for this. They have very large peak to average ratio. And the power amplifier has to amplify the peaks as well as the average levels. So this requires some additional consideration in the design of the power amplifier. A common way, relatively crude, but common way to deal with this is called back off, which is simply using less of the available output swing in the power amplifier. Now that obviously degrades efficiency. So that's the primary contraindication for back off. But back off is the simplest way to accommodate modulations that have peak to average power ratio greater than, than one, like OFDM. Power control. How do you vary the power? Again, a power amplifier is all about delivering power. Now, a lot of devices, like transmitters and mobile phones and transmitters and base stations are required to vary power according to a protocol uh, that is instructions that are provided from the uh, cellular telecommunications network. So how to vary power and keep all these other parameters under control is yet another consideration. Now the book says a little bit more about each one of these things, but here I'm just trying to give you an idea of the considerations that are unique to power amplifier design and that don't necessarily emerge in the design of small signal amplifiers. Finally, I'd like to say something about nonlinear power amplifiers used in linear applications. See, classes C, D, E, and F all utterly nonlinear, but their efficiency is so good that we're constantly looking for ways to use them as if they were linear amplifiers. So one way to do this is to repurpose those nonlinear amplifiers as quasi-linear power amplifiers. I'm not going to say anything about these schemes. I'm just going to give you the names. And uh, if you're interested, you can look this up. And the book says a little bit more about these. Uh, Con EER, Curix, or, or Link, and Doherty. Now, Doherty is increasingly common. There's a recent surge of interest in this. These two are old schemes which keep reemerging. People keep trying them out and, and improving them. And then they kind of fade away again. So if you're interested in power amplifier design, these are techniques that uh, are all of interest. Uh, and I would say right now, Doherty is probably the method which is kind of garnering the most interest. Another way to go is to use linearization. In other words, to take that power amplifier and to make it linear. And ways to do this include pre-distortion, feed forward, and feedback. And there are two kinds of feedback, polar feedback and Cartesian feedback. Again, the book talks about these in detail. But the key idea is that you take a power amplifier, which is nonlinear, has some nonlinear transfer characteristic, and you do something to it to make the output transfer characteristic appear to be linear. So in pre-distortion, the way you do that is by doing something which changes the response at the input so that the product of the responses here is linear. Feed forward and feed back, you're implementing loops from input to output that try to linearize the amplifier. 
for example, trying to estimate the error due to the nonlinear operation and then compensating for it. So again, these are discussed in somewhat more detail in the uh, book. This concludes this lecture on power amplifier classes.